bitter pat. You know that happy tune is Wait, your no. step. You know the honors. No, no, no. Life could be <laughs> so yes. Just do it. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Tuesday morning plenary session. Yes, it is. It is only Tuesday, even <laughs> though yesterday might have seemed like two to three days worth of sessions and meetings in one. My name is Renee Callanan. I am a chronic disease and oral health epidemiologist at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. I'm also the CSTE Chronic Disease Epi Capacity Building Subcommittee Chair. Hi, I'm Greg Reed. I'm the Maternal Child Health and Oral Health Epidemiologist for the North Dakota Department of Health. And I'm the, sub, the Oral Health Subcommittee Chair for the Chronic Disease MCH and Oral Health Committee at CSTE. And Renee and I will be moderating this session. And Greg and I are your CSTE Executive Board candidates for the Chronic Disease MCH and Oral Health Chair position. The Planning Committee put together a great plenary session today. I think it, we have three great speakers. The title of the plenary session is Epidemiology, Looking and Seeing. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. David Katz. Dr. Katz is the founding director of Yale University's Prevention Research Center. He received his BA from Dartmouth College, his MD from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and his MPH from the Yale University School of Public Health. He is a two-time diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine, a board-certified specialist in preventive medicine, public health, and a clinical instructor in medicine at the Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Katz is known internationally for expertise in nutrition, weight management, and chronic disease prevention. He has published roughly 150 scientific articles, innumerable blogs and columns, and nearly 1,000 newspaper articles, and 12 books to date, with three more currently in production. He is the editor-in-chief of the journal Childhood Obesity, president-elect of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, founder and president of the nonprofit Turn the Tide Foundation, and a blogger, medical reviewer, review board member for the Huffington Post. Dr. Katz remains active in patient care and directs the Integrative Medicine Center at Griffin Hospital in Derby, Connecticut. His talk today is entitled Feet Forks and the Fate of the Nation. Please welcome Dr. Katz. Good morning, folks. Nice to be with you. Our theme is looking and seeing. Suits me fine. Look, if we want to get out of the woods, we're going to have to see the forest through the trees. Whose woods these are? I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of the easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Well, I suppose all of us in public health have promises to keep, don't we? So let's traverse the miles. We'll spend a few of them together here this morning, and here are the mile markers for that little journey. We'll talk about the dark wood of modern epidemiology. We'll discuss what's been lost in translation over a span of decades. 
We'll take a look at the promise of lifestyle to public health and the human condition, the problem that has for far too long already forestalled our progress, consider the potential leverage of thinking about a levy, discuss the road less traveled, and see what we can do about putting health on a path of lesser resistance, and then finally, let's see if we can take in the view of that forest through the trees. Or perhaps it's the proverbial elephant in the room. But we begin in the dark wood of modern epidemiology where people are dying of chronic diseases. They're dying of heart disease, cancer, stroke, respiratory diseases, diabetes. And for quite some time now, if one were to recite the leading causes of death among adults in the United States, those would be the typical answers. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, respiratory disease, diabetes, in that order and fixed there for a span of decades. But I trust many in this room know that that perspective of causes was forever altered with the publication in 1993 of a seminal paper by Bill Feige and Mike McGinnis entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. McGinnis and Feige pointed out something that should perhaps have been obvious all along. Diseases, in fact, are not really causes. Diseases are effects. And they thought to ask the question, effects of what? And so they got their arms around this issue, wrestled the relevant epidemiology under control, and pointed out to us all that almost all of the premature deaths in our society were attributable to a list of factors which overwhelmingly any one of us controls in our daily life. And that list of ten was in turn overwhelmingly dominated by just the first three. In 1990, the leading cause of premature death in the United States was tobacco use. Still is. Two and three were bad use of feet and forks, poor dietary pattern, lack of physical activity. So together they constituted the second leading cause of premature death. So 80% of all the action was just those three things. If you will, feet, forks, and fingers. The leading cause of years lost from life and perhaps more importantly, since we're talking about chronic disease, life lost from years. This was the epidemiologic landscape in 1990, but I see a lean, hungry look in your eye. It may just be the hour of the day. Uh, but I suspect you prefer your data fresher. Not to worry, we have them. Ten years later, Ali Mokdad and others at the CDC reanalyzed this same issue, reaching substantially the same conclusion, all really that had changed over the span of a decade, is that the gap between tobacco as the number one cause of premature death and the combination of bad use of feet and forks as number two had narrowed for one good reason, the strides we've made against tobacco use, and one bad, deteriorating use of our feet, degenerating use of our forks, worsening epidemics of obesity and diabetes. This then was the landscape in 2000, but I, I know you people, you want fresher data. We've got them. 2009, Earl Ford and colleagues again at the CDC published results of survey research conducted among 23,000 adults in and around Potsdam, Germany. They asked these 23,000 people about four factors. They asked them, do you smoke, yes or no? Do you eat well, yes or no? Habitual intake of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Are you physically active on a regular basis, yes or no? And do you control your weight near the optimal, yes or no? And I, I don't have the time this morning for a full digression into this topic, but I trust this is an enlightened audience that recognizes weight is not a behavior. Right? Nobody wakes up and decides what to weigh. Weight is an outcome of some behaviors we control, like calories in and calories out, both of which are already on Ford's list, and some we don't control, like genetic polymorphisms, our ethnic heritage, and perhaps our microbiome. But I do digress back to Ford's study. They asked about four factors, and they went on to compare the two ends of the spectrum. So they compared, I don't smoke, I eat well, I'm active, my weight's fine, to I smoke, eat badly, I'm inactive, my weight is bad. These people, over the span of a lifetime, had an 80% lesser likelihood of developing any major chronic disease than these people. 80% lesser probability of heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, all of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Flip the switch on any one of these behaviors from bad to good and the lifetime probability of any major chronic disease goes down 50%, but fire on all four cylinders. Lifetime probability of any major chronic disease 
is reducible by 80%. Now imagine if the news were to break tomorrow, front page above the crease of whatever it is you most like to read, that there's a new drug available by prescription, available in bountiful supply, stunningly inexpensive, shockingly free of side effects, safe enough for children and octogenarians alike, and taken once daily for the rest of your life. <laughs> will reduce your risk of ever getting any major chronic disease by 80%. Which would you do first? Call your doctor to get a prescription or call your broker to buy stock in the company that owns the stuff? Both would be good ideas. But for the fact that there is no such pill, in my opinion, there never will be any such pill. But lifestyle is exactly that medicine, and we've known about it since 1993 at least. Anyway, if you happen not to like Potsdam for some reason, or prefer your data fresher still, we have them. These findings were replicated yet again a couple of years back by Kavavik et al. in a cohort study in the UK even more recently than that here in the U.S. by McCullough et al. In essence, what we have is a repetitive drumbeat in the peer-reviewed literature spanning these 20 years or more, telling us over and over again of the power of a very short list of lifestyle factors over nothing less than our medical destinies. Nor is the beat of this drum consigned to the surface. Rather, it reverberates to our very pith and marrow to within the double helix of DNA itself. We're more than a decade into the dawn of the genomic age. If we thought to found isolated genetic causes and cures for chronic disease, we have cause for disappointment. But only if we mire down in the nature-nurture debate. Only if we think that question is legitimate. Where does the greater power center reside? In the genetic hand we're dealt? Or in how we play that hand? The reality is that the question serves up a false choice, a false dichotomy, and potentially a dangerous distraction. For the reality is, we can nurture nature. In this study by my friend Dean Ornish and colleagues, they enrolled 30 men with early stage prostate cancer, amenable to watchful waiting, and then did more than just watch and wait. They gave these men the benefit of a comprehensive lifestyle program, feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love good diet, tobacco avoidance, regular physical activity, good social interactions, adequate sleep, all the good stuff. Over a span of months, they went on to study not so much the men, not so much the cancer in the men, but preferentially the genes in the men with the cancer. And they found that the lifestyle intervention took 500 cancer promoter genes and dramatically downregulated their expression. 50 cancer suppressor genes and dramatically upregulated their expression. The power of lifestyle, something we all control, is such that we can refashion fate at the very level of our genes. We can, in fact, nurture even nature. Nor is this an isolated study. It's a whole branch of the literature filling up fast. So I think the case can be made as we contemplate our fate, the fate of our families, the fate of our patients, fate of the nation. I think the case can be made that the master levers of medical destiny are nothing at the cutting edge of biomedical advance, nothing that will require a new Nobel Prize, not the tools of our trade in the corridors of hospitals. The master levers of medical destiny are feet, forks, and fingers. And you all know what Archimedes told us about a lever. Give me one long enough and I can move the whole world. Well, make no mistake, these levers are long enough and should long since have served to move the whole world of modern epidemiology and public health to a better place. But, alas, we like to say knowledge is power. Would that it were so. The gap between what we know, indeed what we have long known, and what we do with what we know belies that wishful thinking. Much has been lost in translation, or perhaps, from an epidemiologic perspective, much has been lost for the failure of translation, translating what we know into what we routinely do. So as we convene here this morning, we are on the nearer side of a precipice. We have the knowledge. Power waits across the divide. The promise of lifestyle to public health and the human condition its contribution to the fate of the nation 
is the luminous promise just ahead and the miles we must traverse if those promises are to be kept are the miles of translation and we must walk them together because in the end the best defenses of the human body reside with the body politic and of course we cannot allow the status quo to perpetuate we know what it looks like everybody's seen these maps from the CDC this was obesity prevalence in 85 this is 95 and 2010 and of course obesity is just a canary in the coal mine of chronic disease so here are the diabetes trends over a similar span and while we have been in the frying pan we're headed for the fire the CDC projects that by mid-century should current trends persist one in three of us will be diabetic and current trends thus far are persisting now folks let's look at that and let's see what it means there are 27 million diagnosed diabetics in the US right now one in three means over a hundred million I don't know all the politics in the room we're public health types I suspect we tend to lean left and maybe we favor health care reform maybe some in the room don't doesn't matter we can all acknowledge that much of the fuss was about dollars if it were all free nobody would give a hoot wouldn't have had all that trouble but here's the thing I think the whole damn mess is moot if a hundred million of us have diabetes when one in three of this population have a chronic potentially disabling costly disease there's just no way to pay that bill the only hope is prevention so we signed up for various missions all related to health but we find ourselves gathered on the front lines of nothing less than homeland security and hence the title of this talk because I truly believe unless we put out the fire unless we find our way out of the woods see the forest through the trees it is nothing less than the fate of the nation that hangs in the balance and of course the writing is on the wall for the next generation the generation that will inherit this nation from us yes a hundred million of them will be diabetic but there's worse to follow if we let that come to pass kids are already accumulating cardiac risk factors when seven and eight year olds get what used to be by the way adult onset diabetes when I went to medical school I learned about two kinds of diabetes juvenile onset and adult onset when we didn't like the epidemiology of it we just changed the name kids are getting this now we'll call it type 2 and make it okay type 2 is a euphemism for adult onset diabetes when kids get it it's a travesty but the story doesn't end there seven and eight year olds get adult onset diabetes they've had it for a decade by the time they turn 17 and 18 I know a 17 year old who had a triple coronary bypass I shudder to think the day may dawn on our collective watch when angina is an adolescent rite of passage alongside acne I have teenagers acne's bad enough <laughs> and although I've been a prophet of doom on this topic for the better part of two decades even I didn't foresee a 35 percent increase in the rate of stroke among five to fourteen year olds but that's been reported in national data even as the rate of stroke declines among those 50 and older due to better detection and treatment of hypertension this then is the dark wood is there a bright side well in fact there is if we acknowledge these as the dark clouds of modern epidemiology there is a silver lining every bit is luminous in fact if knowledge were power I could say to you we can eliminate 80 percent of all heart disease right now we can eliminate 90 percent of all diabetes we could eliminate 60 percent or nearly so of all cancer I could say this to you and I can cite peer-reviewed literature to back me up in fact you know what I am saying this to you I am citing the literature to back me up and I'm wondering if in doing so I brought a tear to any eye or a lump to any throat in the back a lump perhaps tearless lumpless insensitive bastards I'm appalled or then again maybe there's something else we need to look at and generally fail to see these are stunning statistics among the most stunning in the history of public health and certifiably true but at the end of the day they're statistics they're dull they're dry they're bland and they are anonymous I work in public health 
I've long accepted that public health is encumbered by a potentially crippling fiction. For you see, there is no public. There's just you and me and everybody else. The public is nameless. The public is faceless. The public is impossibly hard to love. And it's hard to do a difficult and arduous job in the absence of passion. So I'm going to call on you to help me find the passion by looking at the private parts of public health. If you or someone you love, and, and I don't care what you do professionally, we're just talking about you or someone you love has been affected by heart disease, would you please raise your hand and keep it in the air? If you or someone you love has been affected by cancer and your hand's not up, please add your hand to those in the air. And if you or someone you love, just you or someone you love has been affected by stroke or diabetes and you don't have one or both hands in the air, please raise your hand and folks look around the room. And as you do, conjure to your mind's eye the face of the person you love, maybe more than one, pick one, and recall that day, the phone call, the trip to the emergency room, the ICU, the CCU. I hope they got better and came home. We all know the reality. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But either way, it was a terrible day, an anxious, awful day. Every one of us has been through it, most of us more than once. Here's the thing. If knowledge were power, if we stopped at nothing to turn what we have known these 20 years or more into what we routinely do in every community, eight out of 10 of us in this room would not have had cause to put our hands in the air. That's what the reduction by 80% of the chronic disease burden feels like, and as we look around the next bend and think about our kids and grandkids, we can bequeath to them a future in which these chronic diseases and dreadful phone calls occur ever more often at ever younger age, or in which eight times in ten, they just don't happen. And I think the basis for all of that is passion. For when we part the veil of statistical anonymity, there is no public. The faces we see looking back at us are the faces of people we know, and the faces of people we love. We've all got skin in the game, the skin of our loved ones. So, given knowledge and a clear basis for passion, what the heck? Why haven't we just gotten this job done, eliminated 80% of all chronic disease? There must be something formidable blocking the way, and indeed I think something fairly formidable is. In essence, if you take this and you add this, Inevitably, you do get this. <laughs> In much the same way as if you took this and added this, you would get this. And I give you my figurative trademark for the better part of 20 years, the polar bear in the Sahara. Now, I'm not here to talk about climate change. When my wife and I first put this slide together, there was no imminent threat of this actually happening to polar bears. Uh, alas, that may also be a problem now. Barbara may address that, otherwise you'll have to invite Al Gore to your next conference. <laughs> My point is simply, there's something wrong with this picture. Polar bears are marvels of survival, beautifully adapted to one of the Earth's harshest climates, but only adapted to that climate. The very traits and tendencies that foster your survival in the cold would cook your goose in the heat. You soak up and retain warmth where it's scarce, it keeps you alive. You do it under the burning sun of the Saharan summer, you overheat. My point, of course, is we are polar bears in the Sahara. Throughout most of human history, calories were relatively scarce and hard to get, and physical activity was unavoidable. It did not require gym membership or specialized footwear. It was called survival, and everybody did it every day. We have devised a modern world in which physical activity is scarce and hard to get, and calories are unavoidable. Houston, we have a problem, and Pasadena, and Hartford, and every place else as well. I submit to you that as a species, Homo sapiens has no native defenses against caloric excess or the lore of the couch, never having needed them before. No native defenses, that is, save one. Great big Homo sapien brains. Arguably, we're smarter than the average bear. And we can think our way out of this mess, but it requires an exercise in navigation. Our problem is not failure to know where there is. We know how to eliminate 80% of all chronic disease right now. Question is, can you get there from here? 
And in the final few minutes of a brisk talk, I want to make the case that yes, we can get there from here. And I'll switch my metaphors to do so, from the master levers of medical destiny to a levy. I like the levy metaphor for several reasons. First, what we all confront in this space is like a flood, a flood of highly processed, hyper palatable, nutrient dilute, energy dense, bet you can't eat just one glow in the dark foods. A constant flow of marketing dollars encouraging us and our kids to eat the very foods that propel us toward obesity and chronic disease. Wave after wave of technological advance giving us gadgets and gizmos that do all the things muscles used to do. A great big obesogenic, morbidogenic flood. Want to contain a flood? Build a levee. Another reason I like the levee metaphor is because uh, presumably I was invited here as some sort of expert in chronic disease prevention, obesity. And yet, during the 20 year span of my career, obesity and chronic disease have gotten, what, worse? Yeah. I suck. The only good news here is that everybody else involved in this space sucks just as much as I do. So if you work in this space, you suck too. Or maybe the problem is we just haven't stacked enough sandbags yet. So when I am feeling like I suck and the task is overwhelming, I remind myself it's a great big flood. Rome wasn't built in a day. It's hard to turn the Titanic around, all that good stuff. And on any given day, I can be part of the problem or part of the solution. And if I'm stacking sandbags, I'm part of the solution. We just have to keep at it. I'm not going to do the whole thing by myself. I'm not going to get it done in a day. But every day I want to be part of the solution. So I'll keep stacking sandbags till my back gives out. And the third reason I like the levy metaphor is we tend to be a quick fix, silver bullet, active ingredient kind of society, right? I mean, when I appear on the, the show of my friend Dr. Oz, I get a thousand emails afterwards from people who saw the segment and are now convinced that's the thing, right? Of course, a week before it was a different the thing, next week it'll be yet another the thing. I mean, it doesn't matter if you take good care of yourself in general, there's always the thing to look for. Coming up on the next episode of the Dr. Oz show, right? Well, that's a bit like putting down a sandbag and wondering if it's the thing. Are we dry yet? Well, no. It doesn't matter if it was a good sandbag. And if you say, well, that wasn't the right sandbag, I'll wait for the next one to come along. Ah, this looks like a really good one. Are we dry yet? And again, disappointment. And this would be a silly discussion, but for the fact we actually do this. My colleagues and I have done systematic reviews and meta-analyses of the obesity prevention and control literature. And we found that investigators routinely rest failure from the jaws of success, overreaching with any one study, expecting it to do the whole job. The causal pathway for obesity and chronic disease, the things that imperil our nation, are like a floodplain. Toss one program at this, it's like throwing one sandbag into a floodplain. Flow will simply divert around it. We want to arrest the flow and change what's going on downstream. We've got a big job to do a job to which every one of us can contribute every day. We've got to raise a levy. Now, I've been philosophical up until now. How about a few minutes of practicality? Because at this stage of my career, I am a sandbagger and proud of it. This is what I do. I aspire to nothing else. I manufacture, stack, test, and as appropriate attempt to disseminate sandbags. So let me leave you with practicalities because I'm a cautious optimist. I think we can build this thing. So here are some examples. We heard in JAMA just a few months back that 20 minutes of physical activity five days a week is enough to immunize high-risk kids against diabetes. 20 minutes out of a day, by the way, is 1.39% of the minutes in a day. 20 minutes five times a week is 0.99% of the minutes in a week for less than 1% of a kid's weekly minutes. We can deflect them away from developing adult onset diabetes in childhood. The problem, though, of course, is that for a decade or more, no child left behind has left all the children on their behinds as we jettison phys ed and recess from the schools. Well, I got fed up with this, but couldn't solve the problem until my son, Gabriel, inspired the solution. Now, this is a nice anecdote, but there's no time for it. Suffice to say, my wife and I have five kids, four daughters and a son. We came out of retirement at her suggestion to try one more time and see if I could make a Y chromosome. Turns out I can under circumstances I'm not prepared to discuss, but, <laughs> but my son Gabe, who'll be 14 this month, inspired ABC for Fitness when he was five, attended a talk of mine, couldn't sit still, and had to run laps around the audience. 
The proper remedy for rambunctiousness in children is recess, damn it, not Ritalin. We take naturally rambunctious kids, send them to school, bolt them to chairs all day long so they can grow up to become adults. We can't get off couches with crowbars and medicate them along the way when they go bonzo, right? We can reconcile the square peg of physical activity to the round hole of the school day. ABC for Fitness stands for Activity Burst in the Classroom, comprehensive program of brief structured activity burst teachers can dole out throughout the day to kids when they're unteachable anyway. And then they can teach during those episodes, so five, six minute activity bursts can be added to reading, writing, arithmetic. Done right, reading, writing, arithmetic, and recess are synergistic, not competitive. That all sounds good, but I'm a scientist. You can't just trust this stuff, you have to verify. We conducted a controlled intervention in a thousand kids, half got ABC for fitness, half got business as usual. The half that got ABC for fitness had significant improvement in key measures of fitness, stable performance on standardized tests, fewer behavioral problems and fewer were ever sent to the principal, significant reduction in all medication use, significant reduction in medication use for asthma, surprise, and a 33% reduction in medication use for ADHD. Recess, damn it, not Ritalin for rambunctiousness in kids. It started as a rant. It's now a data-driven rant. And it's part of a bigger story. Sound mind, sound body should sound familiar. It's the kind of sensible advice we got from our grandparents. Forgot about it somewhere along the line. At the cutting edge of biomedical advance and RCTs, we're finding our way back to the future. We have a program like this for adults called ABE for fitness. Help yourself. These are free, by the way, freely available to all. ABE is a library of videos online. This is for adults in the workplace. Do brief structured activity bursts at your desk throughout the day. Get 30 minutes of physical activity on those days you don't have time for the gym. Free and available to all with internet access. We have a sandbag on the nutrition side for kids. I trust there are Michael Pollan fans in the room by a show of hands, yay. Okay, eat food, not too much, mostly plants, great advice, but you're standing in the bread aisle of a supermarket, how does it help? Here's one that does, the shorter the ingredient list, the better. It's a translation of pollen, it's just actionable where the rubber hits the road. Nutrition Detectives is a free DVD available in English and Spanish, distills food label literacy down into five clues that fit on a refrigerator magnet like the shorter the ingredient list, the better. And eight-year-olds can master this stuff. We know because we tested it, 1,200 families. What was surprising is that not only did the kids acquire significant enhancements in their food label literacy, so did the parents. And the infectious disease epidemiologists in the room will appreciate the fact that we didn't teach the parents. We just infected the kids with knowledge and sent the little vectors home. <laughs> We're now reaching out to middle school and early high school kids with a music video program called Unjunk Yourself. So if you would Google Unjunk Yourself, you'll find these on YouTube. We have two videos so far, Unjunk Yourself, the maiden video, and the process. We've been processing food and now we're processing you. We're here to climb in your mind where we'll control what you chew. We want kids to rebel against that kind of manipulation. We've also found that kids should be part of the solution. You can just improve school food, but what we've done in Connecticut is put a guidance system in school so the kids know which foods are better and why, and they're a part of the process, and then that revolt that we tended to see when we just swept out old foods, put in new, and didn't involve the kids all went away. So we should make them part of the solution. We should also make them part of the solution when we think about worksite wellness. Starbucks cannot afford to keep spending more money on disease care than coffee beans. No business can afford $1,800 office chairs. So businesses are investing in worksite wellness. Meanwhile, the kids of those employees are financial dependents who go to public schools who don't have the resources to do wellness there. So the parents go home, the kids don't want to play the health game, and what happens at the worksite may stay at the worksite. The basic functional unit of our society is not the lone individual. John Donne told us, no man is an island basic functional unit of our society and our culture is the family. So businesses currently adopt stretches of highway. How about businesses applying wellness strategies in schools? What about a national program? Help me here, folks, because this is aspirational, where businesses and chambers of commerce adopt schools and say, we'll sponsor complimentary wellness programming because the kids will cost us less, their parents will cost us less, you'll get what you need, the kids will get healthy, they'll learn better, everybody wins. The future of health promotion is not we win, you lose. It's win, win, win. We developed a lifestyle counseling program for healthcare professionals called OUCH. This is free and brings with it four hours of Category 1 CME credit from Yale University. Help yourself. Online weight management counseling for healthcare professionals doesn't really have to hurt a bit. 
It's based on 15 years of research we've done at the Prevention Center at Yale examining the translation of best behavior change models to the primary care setting. This is available for free online. And, and by the way, slides will be left behind, right, guys? So all these URLs, you'll have them. Otherwise, you can email me. We've incorporated this into a family-friendly weight management program called Way Forward, currently available in Texas. This is not free and coming soon to the rest of the country. I've been privileged to be involved in another whopping sandbag. It's a boarding school in rural South Carolina that treats severe obesity in teens. And what we're looking to do here is hook this resource up to public schools so the kids who are too far gone to get help in the public school can be sent to the boarding school for a semester at less than the cost of the bariatric surgery they otherwise need. And we did this with 13 kids last year. They lost a collective 756 pounds, more than 50 pounds on average. One kid lost 100. More important than what they lose is what they find, self-esteem, self-respect, and skill power. You know the thing about bariatric surgery, you get it while under general anesthesia. You know the thing about general anesthesia? It's hard to learn anything while you're doing that, all right? Much better to be conscious if you want to learn something, right? Skill power that competes with bariatric surgery is a beautiful thing because you can't pay forward the benefits of a scalpel. Skill power you can pay forward to family and friends. And then finally, I wrestled with the fact that my wife Catherine, a PhD in neuroscience from Princeton, had trouble picking out the most nutritious bread at the supermarket. I thought that set the bar a little high. I proposed a project to the feds. They didn't do it, but we did. Over a two-year span, I and, and in, in the privileged company of my most illustrious colleagues, like the chair of nutrition at Harvard, Walter Willett, the inventor of the glycemic index, David Jenkins, uh, really a dream team. We invented the overall nutritional quality index algorithm. It includes all these nutrients. And out the far end popped a program called NuVal, which we think of as GPS for nutrition. One to 100, the higher the number, the more nutritious the food. Here, too, we didn't just trust, we verified, we conducted a number of studies. But the most important study wasn't done by us. It was done by the Harvard School of Public Health. NuVal scores were assigned to all of the foods consumed by 100,000 people, and health outcomes were tracked over 20 years. The higher the average score of their foods, the lower their rate of cardiovascular disease, the lower the rate of diabetes, the lower their BMI, and the lower the rate of premature death from any cause. We can help people get to better diets and better health, one well-informed choice at a time, and we can help one person at a time. Sally Galvin shops in a supermarket that has Nuval. That's all she did, and over 18 months, lost 115 pounds. There are many stories just like hers. One of the many virtues of more nutritious foods is they fill us up on fewer calories. This is currently in about 1,700 supermarkets coast to coast, so we're reaching about 30 million people. It's a good sandbag but it's not yet the whole levy by any means. It is to some extent an urban legend that more nutritious food costs more. We've studied that. Sometimes it does, but a bigger problem is that very often people can't ad identify the more nutritious food that doesn't cost more. And finally, as I talk about the levy and bring this talk to a close, and, and apologies that it's both brisk and, <laughs> whoops, sorry, and compressed, I have a dream. I call the dream fingertips, both because my aspirations are all about putting empowering programming right at people's fingertips, but also because it's an acronym, financial incentives and nutritional guidance in educational and retail settings, taking it to the people in the street. And I trust you will agree that is a kick-ass acronym. <laughs> and the idea here is that we currently spend $100 billion in tax money to underwrite SNAP to help poor people get poor food and go to poor health. We then spend a ton more money through Medicaid to pay the cost of that poor health. Who in this scenario wins exactly, right? What if instead we used a system that scored 100,000 foods, one to 100, correlates with health outcomes as a meter to attach financial incentives? So the higher the score of a food in any given category, the less it costs. Buy a food in the bottom quartile, your dollar's worth a dollar. Buy a food in the next quartile, your dollar's worth a dollar twenty-five. Top quartile, it's worth two dollars costs a lot less to incentivize healthy food than to pay for coronary bypass and bariatric surgery. And if this works in the public sector, why not the private sector? Why not deals between private insurance companies and supermarkets where they offer the financial incentive to use the system in the store because when your clients eat better, they cost us less. Everybody can win. These are some of the sandbags in the levy. I'm describing my own not because they're the best. I just know them best. I'm in the company of many excellent sandbaggers, and we've got more sandbags on the assembly line back at the shop. For far too long, we have left health on the road less traveled. What we'd like to do is put it on a path of lesser resistance. Frankly, I think that's possible. I think we can fulfill the promise. 
but we can only traverse the miles and get out of the woods if we see the big picture, if we see the forest through the trees, or if you will, the elephant in the room. It was six men of Indistan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second feeling of the tusk cried, Ho, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp to meet his mighty clear. This wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out an eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, E'en the blindest man can tell what this resembles most, deny the fact who can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth, no sooner had begun about the beast to grope, than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope, I see, quoth he, the elephant, is very like a rope. And so these men of Indistan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all we're in the wrong. So oft in theologic wars the disputants I ween tread on in utter ignorance of what each other mean and prate about an elephant not one of them has seen. My friends, I fear we're prone to the same tendencies in epidemiology. But I'm hopeful. I think we understand that the best defenses of the human body reside with the body politic. I think we understand the need to see the forest through the trees if we want to get out of the woods. From the start, it was my intention to make the case for good invention. For where there's a will, there's a way to be paved so the health of our nation can be righted and saved. And I'm confident we can escape our doom if we just see the elephant or possibly the polar bear here in the room. Thank you all very much. I'd like to really thank Dr. Katz for his time. We'll hold questions till the end of this meeting due to time. Uh, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Peter J. Hotez, and he is an MD and PhD. He's a founding dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, where he is also a professor of pediatrics and molecular bio biology and microbiology, and chief of the section of pediatric tropical medicine. In addition, Dr. Hotez holds the Texas Children's Hospital Endowed Chair of Tropical Diseases, excuse me, Tropical Pediatrics, and serves as president of the Sabin Vaccine Institute, where he leads the new Sabin Vaccine Development the program at Texas Children's Hospital and the Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I'm personally in, looking forward to hearing from him because my background is in microbiology, and uh, I've read some of his research uh, dealing with tropical diseases in the Balkans. So, Dr. Hotez. Thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, Dr. Katz is indeed a hard act to follow. I'll, I'll do my best. We're going to be really talking about uh, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, really the diseases of uh, the most impoverished uh, uh, this morning. But before I do that, I wanted to say that how uh, honored I was to be invited to come and, sp and speak with you. And the reason is, is because I consider all of you extraordinary heroes. Heroes in the sense, just like when we talk about our nation's firefighters or first responders, I think a lot of times we don't give a due credit to all the hard work you've done, which is mostly uh, behind the scenes. And I think we need to do a better job telling the country, or the world even, about uh, the amazing uh, work that you're doing. And I feel very honored and humbled to be able to uh, speak before what look like several hundred heroes uh, here before me this morning. So thank you uh, for that. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, this group over here, kind of the, uh, 
the, the 180 degree opposite of, of what uh, David was speaking about. A group sometimes referred to a bottom, the bottom billion, meaning the 1.3 billion people in the world who live on nothing, who live below the World Bank poverty figure of $1.25 a day, who really live on no money. Uh, and, and I've written a book now uh, on these uh, diseases uh, that almost exclusively affect the bottom billion. It's a book called Forgotten People, Forgotten Diseases. Uh, my wife likes to call it the forgotten book on forgotten people uh, with forgotten <laughs> diseases. But it's, uh, but it's, as only a wife could, right? But it's now gone into uh, the, uh, it's now gone into its uh, second edition, and we got, uh, uh, got uh, Soledad O'Brien from CNN to write a forward for it, so uh, we'll see. Maybe it'll be a little less forgotten. It's, a, it's a, a supposed to be a popular book uh, about neglected uh, tropical diseases, and it's gotten some interest in, among young people interested in global health, and it really deals with these diseases here. Uh, a group that uh, we coined the term in 2004-2005, the NTDs, the neglected tropical diseases. Uh, the original list had 13. The World Health Organization has now expanded it to 17. Uh, and there's, there's different n numbers on different lists, but this is as good as any. And they really represent the most common infections of poor people, which I'm now going to list for you. I like to call them the most important diseases. I wouldn't say to this group you've never heard of, because you have, but the most important diseases you probably don't think about very often uh, during your day. So they include this one, Ascariasis intestinal roundworm infection, affecting 800 million people in the world, like this little boy on the right with the uh, large distended uh, abdomen. He's also stunted for height and weight and does poorly on tests of uh, IQ and cognition, and we'll come back to that. Uh, 700 million people with hookworm infection, a lot of these are wormy diseases, 600 million people with whipworm, so you see that already adds up to more than 1.3 billion, so people are polyparasitized. They have multiple diseases at the same time. 400 million people with schistosomes in their vasculature, 100 million people with filarial worms in their genitals and lymphatics, foodborne trematode infections, dengue, river blindness, trachoma, leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, really ulcer, uh, leprosy, and sleeping sickness. I have that term, the biblical diseases on the lower right. That's to refer to the fact that these are just the opposite of emerging infections, right? These have been around forever. You can find descriptions of these in the Bible, in the Talmud, the writings of Hippocrates, Egyptian uh, papyri. And uh, there's been a, now a, a new a study that's come out that we helped participate in that just was published at the end of uh, 2012. It's being called the Human Genome Project of Global Health. I think that's probably a bit of an embellishment, but it's led by, uh, it's led by Chris Murray at the Institute for uh, Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington, Seattle, and it's supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it's a very useful study, especially for the diseases that I've been just been talking about because most of those diseases you just I listed for you are not killer diseases. People are not dying from these diseases, yet it's causing an enormous amount of disability. And what's nice about this Global Burden of Disease Study 2010, which what it did was uh, uh, actually come up with a metric to look at disease burden for all 291 diseases and injuries in 21 uh, regions, is yes, it did look at death, but it also looked at something else. So the major metric it used was the DALI, the Disability Adjusted Life Year, which stands for the, the number of years of life lost from premature death, which is what's, what YLL stands for, but also the years of life lost through disability, YLDs. And, and this is, so our diseases, the neglected tropical diseases do not come out very high in death, but a lot of DALIs. And I'd encourage you to look at the study because one of the, it, it really pioneers the use of color graphics to project a lot of complicated and detailed data. So for instance, on the lower right, these are the, one of the panels is men, one of the panels is women, age on the x-axis, DALI's on the y-axis, using different color coding to look at whether it's cancer or heart disease. And you can learn a lot uh, very, very quickly. Now, uh, in our diseases that I mentioned, they're mostly not killer diseases, and so what I'm showing you here is from that study, uh, all of those 17 diseases with the blue 
the number of years of life lost through disability, whereas the red years of life lost from premature death. And you can see uh, with a couple of exceptions, such as dengue or rabies or sleeping sickness, almost all of our diseases are disablers, uh, they're not killers. So that confirmed uh, more or less what we are. Uh, first thought. So let me give you some examples of why these diseases are so important. So this is a study that we helped with a few years back. It's looking at age class here, 0 to 3, 4 to 7, 8 to 12, and this is prevalence, the percentage of uh, these children who are infected either with ascaris worms, trichuris worms, or hookworm. And you can see that uh, looking at the yellow, the ascaris, essentially 100% of the kids in this village of Pakila in Guatemala are infected with ascaris worms, almost as many with trichuris or hookworm. And the point being that we can repeat this study in any rural village in Guatemala, any rural village in Belize, Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Panama, uh, and southern Mexico. We can do this in Brazil or Venezuela, take it to Southeast Asia, in C Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand do it in South Asia and India and Bangladesh or Sub-Saharan Africa and then go to the big countries, DR Congo, Nigeria, Sudan. And this is what we find over and over again. 100% of the world's children are infected with uh, these intestinal worms, Ascaris, Trichuris, and Hookworm. And so we've been actively studying this disease and one of the observations that we've come up with is that children have more worms than adults. And what I'm showing you is a graph we're looking at age on the x-axis, number of worms on the y-axis. And you can see that in these endemic villages through all those countries I just mentioned, there's a peak of worminess in the life of an individual between the ages of 5 and 15. So you get this little girl on Paraguay on the left there. And on the bottom there are the worms from that one child after expelling the worms from deworming. By the way, anybody want to throw up their hand? I'll, I'll ask a question to the group. Anybody know why children have more worms than adults? Anybody want to make a guess? Yes. Lack of what? Lack of immunity? That's a good hypothesis. Any others? What, what's that? Eating dirt? Yeah, poor hygiene. So it's actually a trick question. I have no idea. Uh, they, these, are, these are neglected tropical diseases, right? So the most common infections are children. We don't even know why children are more worms than adults. And look at what they do. They're not killing, but I'm showing you this bar graph here, which is looking at negative, very light, light, moderate, heavy infect, infections. And then, uh, for, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a mouse here that points. And on the y-axis is loss of IQ, loss of intelligence. Worms make you stupid. Why is that? Anybody want to throw, make a venture, a guess? Why do worms reduce your intelligence? Mo Someone says nutrition. That's my guess, too. We have no idea either. So the leading cause of intellectual disability in the world, there's not a single published paper on the mechanism. And they not, not only support, reduce uh, intellectual development, they also uh, reduce physical growth. So this is a growth curve that you would see in any pediatrician's office, age on the x-axis, weight on the y-axis. And you can see there's the, the growth is basically flat until we intervene to get rid of the worms. And then there's catch-up growth. What is very interesting is in addition to worms making you stupid and preventing you from growing, now the economists have gone in and showed that chronic hookworm infection results in a 40% reduction in future uh, wage earnings. So these diseases then, and this is a very important point, not only occur in the setting of poverty, but they're a stealth cause of poverty. They actually prevent people from uh, uh, gaining, gaining, uh, gaining money and escaping uh, the, the poverty trap, escaping the bottom billion. Now the other thing that the Global Burden of Disease Study has, has done is, uh, and this is uh, coming right from Chris Murray, at the Institute for Health Metrics, and as I said, it's a fabulous study to look at, is he looked at change over time. He looked at 1990, compared the DALI's disability, adjust, just disability adjusted life years lost between 1990 and 2010, and basically came up with the number that it's been constant, that the amount of suffering in the world hasn't changed very much. But what his, his group is, is saying is that there has been a change in the sense that there has been a uh, rise in the number of DALIs lost from NCDs, non-communicable diseases, basically all of the diseases that Dr. Katz uh, just eloquently spoke about, that there's been a rise around 30% in DALIs from NCDs, but with a commensurate decrease uh, in uh, going 
from uh, in the communicable diseases. So that while the amount of suffering has changed, it's, there's a rise in NCDs and a rise in the decrease uh, in infection. And a lot of the argument is boiled around uh, the big, large, middle-income countries that now you have McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken and now people in India and Indonesia and China are getting fat and happy and getting diabetes and, and everything else. We've pushed back a little bit on that, saying that it's really ignored a hidden burden of, of disease result that, are, that our people are attributing to non-communicable diseases, NCDs, that are actually caused by neglected tropical diseases. Remember, these neglected tropical diseases are chronic they're infections, but they don't behave like infections we ordinarily think about. They're a chronic condition lasting the life of the individual quite commonly. And remember, these are not rare conditions. Everybody's got them who live in poverty. So this is a paper in anticipation of what the Institute for Health Metrics is going to come out with, with together with Abdullah Adal Dar at the University of Toronto. Uh, we wrote that there's a blurring between non-neglected uh, tropical diseases and non-communicable diseases. And let me give you an example. So let's take schistosomiasis in sub-Saharan Africa. So every, if you may remember from your medical school training or your graduate training, this is a bladder infection caused by the adult worms in the vasculature. They deposit those spine-shaped eggs in the bladder to cause granulomas. It leads to hematuria. So, uh, and, and remember, these are huge numbers of people infected, at least 100 million uh, cases in sub-Saharan Africa. Now we think there's probably many more than that. This is resulting in 70 million uh, episodes of hematuria in any given week. So that when you go to the rural villages in sub-Saharan Africa and you ask kids to pee into a cup and hold up their urine, every child's got red urine. Uh, but look at this, 18 million uh, cases of major bladder wall pathology, 10 million cases of hydronephrosis, 1.7 million uh, non-functioning kidneys. Uh, the eggs, the parasite eggs are actually class 1 carcinogens and they're causing squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder and 150,000 deaths. In the GBD 2010, all of that pathology is not being ascribed to schistosomiasis. It's being dumped into the NCD category, the renal disease, the bladder disease. And so it's missing the nuance. It's missing all of that pathology as being caused by NTDs. Uh, but it's even worse than that. So the, uh, we really do ignore what affects people who live in poverty. Uh, for when I was taught about schistosomiasis in medical school, we called it urinary tract schistosomiasis because the eggs were in the bladder causing hematuria and all those things I just told you about. That's because nobody ever bothered to do a colposcopic exam on the girls and women with this condition. It turns out that up to 75% of them have those same granulomas and bleeding on their cervix, their uterus, uh, their lower genital tract. It's a condition we now call female genital schistosomiasis. And uh, it's a cause of pain and bleeding, uh, stigma. And in the lower left are some new estimates that we've come up with. Around 100 million girls and women have this condition. I, I believe it's Africa's most common gynecologic condition. How many people have ever heard of female genital schistosomiasis before? Africa's most common gynecologic condition, right. And that's, and that's, that's typical that we don't think about uh, what's really affecting people living in severe poverty. What's equally interesting now are two large studies that have come out in Zimbabwe and Tanzania showing that lesions in the cervix and uterus and lower genital tract are associated with a three to four fold increase, increase in horizontal uh, uh, acquisition of HIV AIDS. So that there's enormous geographic overlap between HIV AIDS and schistosomiasis. This may be Africa's most important cofactor uh, in its AIDS epidemic, and we never hear about it. And what's more is we have a lot of frustration. We can't get the PEPFAR people, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, to think about incorporating schistosomiasis control strategies into their AIDS programs or into the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Our global health space, unfortunately, is uh, very siloed. So these are why these diseases are so important, not so much that they're killers, but chronic disability, stigma, and poverty, because they're reducing productive capacity. India loses a billion dollars a year uh, through economic losses from lymphatic filariasis, impairing intellectual and physical development in children, adverse pregnancy outcome. This, this is a very important piece to this. Now, what we've done around beginning a few years ago is think about large-scale uh, prevention strategies. And one of the major approaches that I want to tell you about now is through this process of, of mass drug administration. 
That is, going into a disease endemic area using either a very inexpensive medicine or a medicine that's been donated by one of the large pharmaceutical companies and blanketing that whole population at the same time without necessarily trying to establish a diagnosis, just knowing what the prevalence is in the community and doing that because the medicines are so cheap and they have such a good safety profile. So uh, I'll give you an example. In the lower left here is lymphatic filariasis, elephantiasis in the South Pacific Islands. Uh, we've been now been able to uh, eliminate this through mass drug administration used, using diethyl uh, carbamazine uh, citrate. Uh, so not many people know about it, but we're now, uh, have, we've now eliminated lymphatic, we, uh, the global community has eliminated lymphatic filariasis uh, in more than uh, 20 countries. Through this, combination, through this process of mass drug administration. The drug originally cost 0.4 cents a tablet, uh, cheap enough, but now the Japanese company ASI is donating it free of charge. Uh, we can't use DEC in sub-Saharan Africa, so instead uh, ivermectin is used, otherwise known as mectazan, developed by Merck and Company, and it's being used for mass drug administration to control, or in some cases eliminate, lymphatic filariasis, as well as river blindness in sub-Saharan Africa, and this has been scaled up uh, through uh, uh, widespread use of uh, ivermectin now, which is being donated uh, by Merck and Company. And uh, I noticed I saw Richard Besser here before from uh, ABC, and Richard has been one of the real good guys in helping get the word out about the power of uh, this uh, mass uh, drug administration. So Merck and Company is donating ivermectin. On the right, the CEO of Pfizer said, well, damn it, if the CEO of Merck's going to donate something, I better donate something too. And he donates uh, Zithromax. Uh, any of you who are practicing physicians uh, know that you, I, don't, I can't imagine how many scripts you wrote for Zithromax last week, uh, but it, it, it works great for upper respiratory infections, otitis media, strep throat. Pfizer makes a gazillion dollars on it. It also works for mass administration of trachoma. We've also seen great successes in praziquantel uh, for schistosomiasis. One of the things that we did was to look at this whole space and say it's wonderful that these things are happening, but it's been highly inefficient because many of these populations are polyparasitized. So we looked at the world from the standpoint of where these neglected tropical diseases are and noticed that if you look at the seven or eight most common NTDs, ascariasis, trichuriasis, hookworm infection, schistosomiasis, lymphatic filariasis, onchocerciasis, trachoma, and foodborne trematode infections, which are causing disability-adjusted life years as high as uh, HIV AIDS, you can see that they cluster. So you go to a place like Sudan, and you find all seven neglected tropical diseases. So what we did was to look at that and say, well, we can make this a lot more efficient if we would combine these medicines in a package. Uh, that we call the uh, rapid impact package, which we costed out could be administered for 50 cents a person per year because it's once a year, sometimes twice a year. Uh, great safety profile, you can use teachers, you can use community health distributors to uh, deliver the medicines. So we wrote these papers in 2005 and 2006 on the, this concept of the rapid impact uh, package. Now I'm not uh, trained uh, professionally in policy and advocacy, so I didn't really know how to do it other than uh, simply writing the papers and just being as shrill as I possibly could be. And, and it worked. And it worked because one of the things I didn't know at the time was uh, we were working in Washington, D.C. at this time, 2004, 2005. And this was a rare window period when Republicans actually spoke to Democrats and Democrats actually spoke to Republicans. So we were able to work with, the, with President Clinton and the Bush administration. And you get people like in the middle there, Sam Brownback. Uh, anyone know who Sam Brownback is? Yes? The governor of Kansas. What's his political views? That's right, a little bit to the right of the till of the Hun. And, and then we have on the lower left there, uh, Senator Leahy. Anybody from uh, Vermont here? Yes, and Senator Leahy's political views? A little bit to the left of Karl Marx, right. And so we were able, what was great was we were able to get these guys to work together to uh, appropriate the funds. And we did this through uh, USAID. And now we're up to $89 million a year, which may not sound like a lot in today's money, but remember, 50 cents a person per year. We've gotten now 250 million people uh, through this USAID program on, on treatment. And now, and the, and the idea is they're national programs of uh, mass drug administ administration. The UK government has also stepped up now and is, is supporting several additional countries. We're having a lot of frustration getting beyond the 
the US and the UK. For instance, what about China? Right? China's investing billions of dollars in sub-Saharan Africa. What are they doing for neglected tropical diseases? That's right, zero. So how, how do we get the Chinese and, and the other large G20 countries uh, to get involved? We're actually now started to raise some of this money privately uh, through what's called an end fund, an ending neglected disease fund that's based in London. And it was uh, provided, we got some initial seed funding from a private investment group uh, from called Legatum uh, in London. And now we're trying to uh, raise some of this money privately. Uh, now, and we're trying to engage the celebrity community. The problem with the celebrity community is they're a little bit tapped out, right? So we, we already have the Bonos and the Angelina Jolies talking, and, and the, then you get Brad if you get Angelina talking about HIV AIDS and George Clooney talking about malaria. So we tend to get more of the B-list celebrities uh, for our neglected <laughs> tropical diseases. So uh, actually I shouldn't say that. So, uh, so I, do, I tweet now on uh, uh, at Peter Hotez on, on Twitter and now I'm being followed by uh, MC Hammer who's been uh, who's, who's been uh, uh, retweeting my things and then I got Paula Abdul to retweet so I'm thinking now of creating this niche of the one hit wonders of the 80s maybe <laughs> maybe asking if I get vanilla ice to, 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 to help us but we, we did work with Richard Curtis uh, in the UK who uh, who helped uh, write Bridget Jones' Diary and Four Weddings and a Funeral. And what he's done is he's gotten some of the celebrity community there, including Emily Blunt and, um, and uh, Priyanka Chopra, the Bollywood star, and others to put together this video where what we do is we show them uh, people with neglected tropical diseases so you can see how horrified they are, and then we turn the camera on so you can see what they're seeing. And it's a promotional video to help uh, raise some support for this concept of 50 cents a person per year. So I guess we're going to show that video now. We'll see how it works. Get the sound up. see the end of this as much as I do. The great news is, is that we can. All it takes is a simple packet of pills. All it costs is 50 cents. To treat and protect a child for a whole year against all seven of these diseases. What's even more amazing is that if we all join in, we can see the end of all of them by 2020. Join in and be part of something huge by liking N7 on Facebook making a small donation and spreading the word by telling all your friends. Together, Together we, we can see the end. end. See if we can go back, thank you. See if we can go back to the slides. Thank you. So, 
this is often not as easy as it sounds. So what I'm doing is showing you a map of uh, sub-Saharan Africa where schistosomiasis is in, the, is in the red and you can see it look, Africa looks like a big donut with this big hole where, the, where some large countries are. What's going on there? Is, is it because there's no schistosomiasis there? So what are those countries? Right, it's DR Congo, Central African Republic. It's just very difficult to work in some conflict and post-conflict areas. That gets very challenging. The other is this business of siloing the AIDS, the TB, the, uh, the malaria, and the NTD communities. We need to bring that together. The one I want to finish up on is something counterintuitive that we've discovered over the last few months. You know, when we first were looking at these large-scale controls, we assumed sub-Saharan Africa was going to be ground zero for most of the world's 17 neglected tropical diseases. But through uh, the Global Burden of Disease study, what we're finding now more and more is that uh, Asian countries are, uh, have the lion's share of some of the highest disease burden uh, NTDs. And so this is just a color coding of just reflecting that in South Asia, East Asia, a uh, huge problem. And this is a new analysis that I've just done and uh, published in, in foreign policy that came out a few weeks ago. And this is somewhat paradoxical or counterintuitive that the, if you look at the highest disease burden NTDs, most of them actually are occurring in G20 countries places like uh, China, places like India, Indonesia, not so much sub-Saharan Africa, although we, we, we added in Nigeria in there as well because that's on the verge of becoming uh, a G20 country in the sense that it's such an enormous, uh, enormous economy. And, and it's really, this is a, these are poverty maps, and so it's the, the extreme poor living in places like uh, northern India, uh, southern Mexico, uh, northeastern Brazil that are actually counting for most of the world's uh, neglected tropical diseases. And there's an important message that I'll come back to. Now, uh, what about the U.S.? Does the U.S. have poverty? So how much poverty do we have? Well, we had to go through it. So there are 46 million Americans who live below the poverty line. Now, I wouldn't say for a minute that that poverty line is equivalent to Indonesia, much less Nigeria. But it's the, lot, the last two numbers that concern me a lot, which is that 20 million people live in extreme poverty, meaning a standard deviation below the poverty line. And now the University of Michigan Center for Poverty has come up with new numbers saying that 4 to 5 million uh, P Americans live on less than $2 a day. So the first time, to my knowledge, we're talking using the same metric that we'd, we'd used to talking about any of the countries we've just been talking about and applying it to the United States. And just like uh, southern Mexico has a north-south divide, so does the United States. It's the southern states that, that have most of the poverty in this country. And uh, the state of Texas actually has the largest number of people living in poverty. One in five Texans lives below the poverty line. So what we did, and one of the reasons why our National School of Tropical Medicine is based in Houston, is in the last couple of years we've turned that uh, global health uh, lens inward on on the southern part of the United States, and I've uh, in finding uh, quite amount, quite a large number of uh, Americans affected by neglected tropical diseases. At least five million Americans with NTDs, uh, not the ones. Uh, we often mention in that video, but uh, let me give you a couple of examples. So on the lower left there. I have 2.8 million African Americans with toxicoriasis. This is, you know, is a larval uh, worm infection. They migrate through the lungs and the brain. There's been several large studies now coming out showing uh, important links between toxicara and chronic lung disease, even toxicara and asthma, toxicara and chronic developmental delays, toxicara and uh, and uh, uh, epilepsy as well. 2.8 million African Americans are seropositive for, uh, for this disease, mostly s s uh, African Americans living on, in extreme poverty. Uh, uh, the CDC has uh, estimates to suggest around 300,000 uh, Americans with Chagas disease. Other numbers have put those numbers up as high as a million. On the upper right is a, is a map showing the risk, a risk map for Chagas disease in Texas. So we have one in 10 dogs now that are uh, 
uh, infected with Trypanosoma cruzi uh, that cause Chagas disease. Undoubtedly, a large number of these individuals are coming in across the border from Mexico and El Salvador, but the dogs aren't coming in across the border from Mexico and El Salvador. So we clearly have a transmission there. We have a lot of cystocercosis. So in response to this, we've created now uh, what we think is the first tropical medicine clinic in the United States, and we have patients coming in uh, every Friday with cystocercosis and Chagas disease. We have cutaneous leishmaniasis patients with toxic hera. Uh, what, what I'm showing you in the bottom there is a, is a risk map uh, of uh, dengue uh, transmission in uh, Harris County, uh, Texas. So Christy Murray, who works with us, has now evidence uh, that's under review about an emerging dengue problem in uh, Houston. So what does this mean? It means that among the most, just like among the most impoverished Indonesians and Indians and Chinese, we have these NTDs as well. And, and these are not rare diseases. I mean, look at those numbers, 5 million Americans with NTD. So the, the frustration that I have sometimes is the overwhelming emphasis in, in the media and a lot of your time is being taken up with things like uh, H7N9, uh, H5N1 flu. Uh, it's being taken up by uh, uh, this uh, new uh, coronavirus that's emerging out of the Middle East. It's being taken up by anthrax and smallpox. Uh, and I get it. I understand why uh, it's important to have biopreparedness for uh, this group of diseases that are my frustration. I sometimes like to classify as the imaginary illnesses that scare white people. But, <laughs> but, but at, at, the, at the same time, we have this hidden burden of neglected tropical diseases among our most impoverished. And, uh, and you guys have no funding. Uh, and I say you guys, I mean the state and local health agencies, the CDC, doesn't have, are not given the tools to really uh, uh, take this on. And I think we need to figure out a way to, to do both. We have, you know, as a country, I think we should be able to walk and chew gum and handle the imaginary disease that scare white people. I, I, I get scared myself, and I understand why we need to do that. But at the same time, we need to take on these diseases. So this is the, yeah, the most uh, provocative map I'll show, which is the new face of global health. It's the poor uh, living among the wealthy, and I would include the southern United States. And it's a term I call blue marble health. It's not your father's global health of the wealth of, of developing countries versus developing country, developed versus developing countries. It's the poor among them. And so I'll end here by saying that the other piece that I really didn't have time to go into is we also have an enormous research and development agenda because we don't have the drugs, the diagnostics, the vaccines for a lot of these neglected tropical diseases. And this is actually my real day job, which is heading, uh, in addition to the school, the Sabin Vaccine Institute, which is making the next generation of uh, vaccines uh, for these diseases. And uh, we're based at uh, Texas Children's Hospital. And this is our uh, uh, portfolio of what I like to call guaranteed money losing products, uh, which so we're doing this in the nonprofit sector uh, through support from uh, the Gates Foundation, Carlos Slim Health Institute, and the National Institutes of Health, which has been uh, wonderful. Uh, so we have a hookworm vaccine in clinical trials, a schistosomiasis vaccine about to go into clinical trials, and a new Chagas and Leishmaniasis vaccine. So uh, there's a lot of interesting and cool science that goes behind that. I don't have the time to go into that today, but I'll stop here. And as I said, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to talk to you about a group of diseases you don't hear about very often. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hotez. Um, if you check the time, you'll see that we will be going over 10 o'clock, so I apologize for that. But um, let's move right on to the, to the final speaker. Dr. Barbara Natterson Hor Horowitz is a professor of medicine in the UCLA Division of Cardiology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, director of imaging for the UCLA Cardiac Arrhythmia Center, director of the Zubiquity Research Initiative at UCLA, and co-director of the UCLA Evolutionary Medicine Program. In addition to her expertise in cardiology, she is also a psychiatrist. Dr. Natterson Horowitz completed her psychiatry residency and served as chief resident at the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute. She combines her training in psychiatry and cardiology to focus on the relationship between psychological states and heart disease. 
She also serves as a cardio cardiovascular consultant to the LA Zoo as a member of its medical advisory board. Dr. Natterson Horowitz completed her undergraduate studies at Harvard College and received her master's degree from Harvard University. She received her med medical degree from the University of California at San Francisco. Please welcome Dr. Natterson Horowitz. Good morning. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and especially pleased and honored to have followed Dr. Katz and Dr. Hortas' uh, speeches, which were really uh, remarkable and very powerful. Well, my story is a little bit different, and uh, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and share with you how this all started. Well, 10 years ago, I was a pretty typical academic cardiologist here at UCLA. I was an attending physician in the cardiac care unit, teaching medical students and house officers. I was director of imaging for our arrhythmia center, so I was doing a lot of cardiac ultrasound guidance for atrial fibrillation ablations. And then something happened that changed, well, changed my career, my perspective. I, uh, I received a call from one of the veterinarians at the Los Angeles Zoo. And he asked if I would come to the zoo and assist the veterinarians there with some imaging needs that they had. And I should tell you that zoos around the country are manned by extraordinarily capable, board-certified veterinarians who handle a tremendous spectrum of medical illnesses in their patients. But from time to time, veterinarians will reach into the human academic medical communities for assistance. And I was one of the lucky physicians who had this opportunity. Well, what this call did for me was to open my eyes up to a parallel universe of spontaneously occurring illness in non-human animals. And this is my journey. The day that I got that call, I got in my car, and a couple of freeways later, I was standing here in front of the Gottlieb Animal Health and Conservation Center, which is a beautiful state-of-the-art facility up at the Griffith Park Zoo, not far from here. And my first patient I had an opportunity to image was, uh, well, let me just take for a second. I, I had the chance to rule out an aortic dissection on a gorilla. assess a macaw for a heart murmur. I was asked to rule out constrictive pericarditis on a sea lion. A taper, one day a mountain taper, had a lower extremity edema and they wanted to make sure that there wasn't a cardiovascular component to that. There was a condor that had a, a, a poorly functioning right ventricle and an incompetent tricuspid valve that needed an assessment. And in this picture, I'm actually listening to the heart of a lion after a collaborative procedure involving veterinarians and physicians, uh, where we drained her pericardial sac of about 700 cc's of serosanguinous fluid. Now, during this period, when I was being called occasionally to go to the zoo, most of the time, I was taking care of my human patients at UCLA. But I started thinking more and more about the connection between animal and human health. At that time, if you had asked me, what is the connection between the health of animals and humans, I would have pointed to zoonoses. And that probably would have been the end of my answer. But as I was going to the zoo and listening to the veterinarians on rounds, I was hearing them discuss congestive heart failure in a gorilla, or leukemia in a rhinoceros, and even compulsive disorders in a bear. And so I began wondering, how significant is the overlap between the diseases of animals and humans? Moreover, what do veterinarians know that we physicians don't know? And why has there been such a gap between our fields? Well, I began lecturing on something called One Health, which has been in a growing movement to bring the fields of public health, human medicine, and veterinary medicine closer together. And I spoke about the important role of animals, both domestic and wild animals, as sentinels for human illness. I talked about the important role that 
animals played in the life cycle of certain diseases that are important to human illness. And of course, I spoke about what has become a very important theme in the One Health movement, which is recognition that the majority of the emerging infections that will affect human populations are coming from the animal reservoir. But even as I was discussing these infectious disease concerns to medical students at UCLA and around the country, I found that physicians were interested in this subject of animal-human health at that point exclusively as an infectious disease or a public health concern. But because I was experiencing these broadened concerns, the cancer, the heart disease, the psychiatric illnesses, through my work with the veterinarians, I became intrigued with expanding this perspective. So I developed a rubric which came out of a very simple methodology. If I saw a condition in a human patient in my work at UCLA, I looked for it in the veterinary literature. And I asked, do animals get breast cancer? What about prostate cancer? Could an animal get sudden cardiac death? Diabetes? Crohn's disease and other inflammatory bowel diseases? What about hypertension or arthritis? Dysmenorrhea? or sexually transmitted diseases? And of course, the answer to every one of those questions is yes. I should tell you that I have now given this talk to many veterinary schools and at many medical schools, and the response to this slide is very different. When I show this slide to groups of veterinarians and the yeses come floating up, they nod their heads. Yes, of course, this is what they do. But when I show this slide to groups of physicians and medical students, the response is very different. There's noise, sometimes laughter. For the most part, this is news to physicians. We have, over the past 50 to 100 years, become as a profession disengaged from our colleagues on the other side of the species divide. My father's a physician, and he tells me that when he went to medical school, they had a course in comparative physiology and comparative pathology. But he is turning 90 this year. And so sometime between when he went to medical school and I went to medical school, this comparative perspective has dropped out of the curriculum. And as a result, we physicians have lost an extraordinarily important perspective. Well, let me tell you about one of the first patients I had an opportunity to image. I was called by one of the vets about a chimp who had woken up with a facial droop. Now, as you know, when a human patient wakes up with an asymmetrical face, we can get concerned about a stroke. And one of the procedures that we do to assess the nature of the stroke is we do an echocardiogram or a transesophageal echo, which is an internal echocardiogram, to look for a cardiac source for an embolus. And that's what they wanted me to do on this chimp. On this day, I came. There was my patient. She was sedated and intubated. I put the probe in her mouth, slid it down the esophagus. I turned around, and this is what I saw a four-chambered beating heart. And that first time that I saw the, uh, the chimpanzee's heart, I was surprised. And then I was surprised that I was surprised. Because after all, I mean, I knew we shared a common ancestor with the common chimpanzee only about five to seven million years ago. And I knew that we humans shared the vast majority of our genome with chimpanzees and, in fact, with the other great apes. But what I was surprised about that day was more than the physiological similarity. It was, in fact, the pathophysiology. Unfortunately, the slide I don't think is working. Because what I was looking at was not just a four-chambered beating heart in a chimpanzee and a human. But what, I, what you may have noticed in that picture, if you're a cardiologist, perhaps there aren't any here today, but there were blood clots in the right atrium that were moving quickly and, and, and flashing around in the RA, and there was an infiltrative disease of the chimpanzee's heart. This chimpanzee had a form of restrictive cardiomyopathy that I had taken care of for 20 years in human patients. It's a form of cardiovascular disease that I simply never thought about in terms of other animals spontaneously that they might develop. And so I began thinking about other important cardiovascular conditions, and I asked, what about, let's say, aortic dissection? 
So aortic dissection, as you know, is a, an important uh, human condition. It, it uh, affects tens of thousands of Americans every year. It has taken the life of many prominent people, Lucille Ball, more recently John Ritter, the comedian, Albert Einstein. But it also, I didn't know until this project started, is a leading cause of death among adult male gorillas in captivity. And the story behind why that might be is interesting. I then looked at breast cancer. And by the way, I should say that this project, as this was going on, had to do with, um, I, I, when I began thinking about these connections and, and exploring them, I decided that what I needed to do was to really think about how I could bring this information together in a way that I could present to other physicians and then in a more public way. And this actually culminated in um, a book that I wrote about the connection between animal and human health. And so this is sort of, this talk is sort of based on the, the, uh, the chapters as I moved through. Well, one of the most interesting points to me, and I was noticing this um, with the veterinarians I was dealing with, was how much cancer there was in the veterinary community and how much of, a, of an issue it was for them, both uh, companion animal veterinarians, uh, zoo veterinarians, and even some wildlife veterinarians. I asked the question about breast cancer first because I learned first from the zoo veterinarians that breast cancer is a significant problem for the, for the felids, for the, the big cats. Uh, lions, tigers, and actually specifically jaguars in captivity have a pretty high incidence of uh, both breast and ovarian carcinoma. And it turns out there are groups of um, animals, including some domestic dogs, that have a BRCA1 mutation that predisposes them to both breast and ovarian cancer. And as I mentioned, there are uh, jaguars who, whose breast cancer is probably also connected to a BRCA1 mutation. And these kinds of connections, as I was doing my research, uh, began, really amazed me uh, for a variety of reasons, just how uh, it was just interesting because I'd never thought about it before. And then bringing this information back to colleagues, uh, oncologists, breast cancer experts, and realizing that they too had very little knowledge about the spontaneously occurring diseases in their own patients, in the non-human patients. So I learned about animals that had a higher incidence of breast cancer, and then I learned about a whole group of animals, mammals, who have a very low incidence of breast cancer. Since the book's publication last year, I've been speaking at many medical schools and veterinary schools and spent a fair amount of time in the middle of the country at uh, some of the vet schools that are responsible for dairy production and others. And I learned about the professional lactators, dairy cows and dairy goats, who essentially lactate from the time they reach maturity. And they have an almost zero incidence of breast cancer, which of course it, it will not be surprising to this group, thinking about the um, effects of breastfeeding on human populations. But I also learned in this project that not only is cancer not unique to our human species, it's not unique to our modern times. And that is a point which is not always obvious to patients. And I, I think there's some meaning for patients who recognize that while there's lots we can do in terms of cancer prevention, ultimately cancer occurs as a consequence of mutation. And it is mutation which is also responsible for natural selection and evolution. So while we do plenty of things to amplify our risk of cancer, there is actually evidence of cancer long before we humans uh, began interfering with um, our environment and uh, practicing bad habits. And so this chapter uh, on cancer ultimately included uh, both contemporary comparative cancers and also historical paleopathology or paleooncology perspective. Well, one of the topics which uh, is very relevant, uh, particularly in light of Dr. Katz's lecture this morning, was the issue of animal obesity. When I began asking the question about obesity in animals, I found that it wasn't very surprising to me to learn from veterinarians that about 40 to 50 percent of our cats and dogs are now overweight to obese. And it isn't surprising because, after all, we overfeed them and we underexercise them. They're under our care. Actually, just uh, you may be interested to know that there are actually dogs uh, in the UK who have received liposuction. 
They're, and they and it's not done for cosmetic reasons. It's done because they these are some smaller breed dogs that become so obese and they develop lipomas that threaten their spinal health. And so it has to be done so they don't actually develop paralysis. Uh, there is actually a diet pill that is marketed right now for dogs in the U.S., um, which is an appetite suppressant. And there is, a, there is such a significant problem with um, obesity among felines that there is now a diet that's recommended by some veterinarians, which is a low-carbohydrate, high-protein diet for, uh, for the obese feline called, of course, the Catkins diet. But what was particularly interesting in this, uh, this exploration of animal obesity was to learn that, in fact, there are even some feral populations that are also getting fatter. And there are many uh, potential explanations for this. Um, there was a, an interesting article called A Plurality of Obesity Epidemics that looked at some of these populations. And of course, we know that some rodents that are you know, living near cities, not truly feral, are consuming um, our refuse that's, that's higher in calorie and, and higher in fat. And that's not that surprising. But there are also some truly wild populations that have been observed to be getting fatter. Why this is, we don't know. But I think it's important that we physicians and others who are interested in the human obesity problem be aware of these non-human um, epidemics. Because without that perspective, we can't begin looking for environmentally based species spanning effects, be they the microbiome, endocrine disrupting chemicals, perhaps climate change, we don't know. There are some, um, of course, interesting little um, specific obesity syndromes that are seen in some wild animals. There's some adenoviruses, for example, that have been demonstrated to uh, increase weight in, uh, in some rodent populations, uh, and even a parasite that can induce obesity in a dragonfly. But I think the bigger takeaway for physicians from this knowledge is to do what the veterinarians do when they encounter an animal who has gained weight, who is obese. They can't tell that animal patient, you need to cut down on your food. You need to exercise more. What do they do? They look to the environment because they recognize that for an animal, obesity is a disease of the environment. And I love that perspective for the human side. So that chapter was called Fat Planet, and uh, it was fascinating to research and write. I also ended up uh, exploring the issue of sexually transmitted diseases. And the chapter actually ended up being called The Koala and the Clap. <laughs> and it's actually the story of a chlamydia epidemic that is ravaging populations of koalas in Australia. Now, for the, uh, for the 19th century medical historians here, yes, I'm aware that the clap is a historical term for gonorrhea but I couldn't resist the alliteration. Uh, actually, it is chlamydia, and the chlamydia epidemic in Australia is being modeled by wildlife biologists as a way of tracking how diseases, uh, how sexually transmitted diseases can be spread among populations that are practicing unsafe sex <laughs> and have multiple sexual partners. And I think that's a fascinating source of information uh, for human epidemiologists to think about, that, that wildlife biologists think about these questions themselves. There are also um, some other little uh, pockets of infection. Uh, HPV is a significant issue among certain uh, captive and potentially non-captive dolph dolphin populations. There, um, there are uh, herpes epidemics among baboons. Rabbit tra trappers have a significant problem of syphilis. Actually, uh, rabbit syphilis uh, can, be a, can be a problem. Our infectious disease doctors know about that. And there's even something called dog park gonorrhea, <laughs> which you might want to know about when you choose your dog park. But I want to uh, land on a cardiovascular topic because I'm a cardiologist. One day, I was asked to image a tamarind at the LA Zoo. Tamarinds are adorable little monkeys. They live at the top of the rainforest, of the canopy of the rainforest in Central and South America. And there were a group of tamarind who had developed heart failure. Uh, and 
the veterinarians wondered if I could do an echocardiogram on some of them to see if there were early signs of heart failure and if we could intervene with beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, much in the way we would do with human patients. On the day that I got to the zoo, this little tamarind was being sedated, and she was getting very sleepy in a little plexiglass box that they had her in. So I moved closer to her, and I crouched down, and I looked into her eyes. The way that I would look into the eyes of a human patient um, in whom I was trying to create a trust bond. But as I got closer and stared at her and said, oh, you're so cute, little Spitzenbuben, which was her name, the veterinarian put his hand on my shoulder and sternly said to me, please step back, you're scaring her. You're going to give her capture myopathy. And I did as I was told, the, the procedure went on, everything went fine, but when I got home that night, I googled capture myopathy. And I learned that animals, when they are really scared, when they are typically being chased, uh, when they're being restrained, presumably when they believe they're experiencing a pre-predation moment, their bodies are flooded with catecholamines, with adrenaline, which then results in some acute myopathic changes and sometimes acute cardiomyopathy, which sometimes can lead to death. Now, when I heard that, it immediately reminded me of a more recently characterized human cardiovascular condition, something called the broken heart syndrome, or Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Around the year 2000, cardiologists began describing in the human literature patients who, when they had experienced extreme emotions, when they witnessed a loved one dying, or if they, there was a case reported in a woman who had been left at the altar, or uh, a middle-aged man who, who lost his life savings uh, with the roll of a dice. Those kinds of monumental, catastrophic, negative experiences resulted in acute heart failure and sometimes, infrequently, but sometimes death. And I knew that, um, and of course, this was published here um, out of UCLA, uh, Harbor UCLA, about a year after the last major earthquake that we experienced, the Northridge earthquake. You can see that um, January the 17th, 1994, the number of heart attack related deaths uh, relative to the same date, 93, 92, and 91. And just as a, as a sideline, I should tell you that among human beings, it doesn't take a natural disaster or a terrorist attack to induce this effect. There was a, a case of a, a World Cup semi-final match in the late 1990s between England and Argentina. And uh, both countries, because of the Falkland Islands War, there's a lot of antipathy and it was kind of national rivalry. And the, the um, game was determined by a sudden death penalty kick. And the British kicker kicked the ball. The Argentinian jumped up. He caught the ball. And all around England, and by the way, just imagine for a moment the, the sort of uh, let's say the epidemiology of, of the vital signs. Imagine pubs in, in Buenos Aires and pubs in London. People, their eyes riveted to the television screen, their, their blood pressures elevating, their heart rates, their, their autonomic nervous systems highly, highly reactive. And then the Argentinian grabs the ball. In England, this is a picture from a pub. This is from the field, the coach and the kicker. You can feel the autonomics. And the British Medical Journal published uh, an article about a year after the game that <laughs> there was a 25% increase in hospital admission heart attacks uh, for 48 hours following the game's conclusion and a 30% increase in cardiac deaths in the three days um, after the game's conclusion. So this effect is powerful. But there are many questions that remain unanswered. Like, why does this emotionally triggered sudden cardiac death occur when it does? And what are the environmental factors that could act as triggers? And why are some individuals more susceptible than others? But as I learned that animals, from monkeys to shorebirds to ungulates to hoofed animals to rabbits, could experience fear-induced sudden death, I began wondering what we human cardiologists might learn if we broadened our perspective and recognized that these diseases, which we assume to be uniquely human, have this perspective. Might we be able to develop a phylogeny for sudden death? 
those kinds of questions. And furthermore, might we be able to get into a more evolutionarily based question, why has this response survived? Well, I want to move quickly to just another area that I explored in the book, which uh, I was particularly interested in because before I trained as an internist and a cardiologist, I had trained as a psychiatrist. I asked the question, do animals get mental illness? And applying the same methodology, if I saw it in a human patient, I looked for it in an animal, I asked, could an animal develop compulsive disorders? What about separation anxiety? Could an animal develop an eating disorder? What about a psychosis, like hallucinations? What about self-injury? Could an animal ever get intoxicated or high? What about post-traumatic stress disorder? And it turns out the answer to every one of these questions is yes. Now, I don't have much time here to share too much more about this. I'm going to give you a, a couple of little examples of the kind of mental illnesses I learned about in animals. But I host a conference now, it's called the Zubiquity Conference, where I bring together academic veterinarians and academic physicians to discuss the shared diseases of animals and humans. We've had uh, two of them. The third is going to be in November in Manhattan. And we're going to be discussing breast cancer, some infectious diseases, um, some forms of heart disease. But we're also going to be looking at uh, self-injury, anxiety disorder, um, eating disorders in a comparative way. So if you're interested, you can um, look at the Zubiquity website for that. Well, the, one of the most important uh, psychiatric conditions that veterinarians deal with, and I should tell you that there is a field of veterinary medicine where there are boards. It's a subspecialty of veterinary medicine called veterinary behavioral medicine. And uh, they deal with a tremendous amount of separation anxiety. By the way, how many people here have an animal, have ever had a dog, a cat, a horse or a bird that you believe has had what you would consider to be a behavioral disturbance or a psychiatric disturbance? <laughs> the follow-up question that I sometimes ask, uh, and I ask this particularly when I'm giving a lecture to groups of psychiatrists, is how many people have uh, thought about putting their dogs on, or cats, or birds, or horses on a psychotropic medication? Yeah, a lot of doctors admit to uh, prescribing for their pets, which I, I don't advocate, but it was, it's an interesting little finding. Yeah, so separation anxiety is a very significant issue uh, in a number of breeds of uh, dogs characterized by symptoms which are very similar to um, what human patients with separation anxiety uh, exhibit. And there's some interesting work that's being done looking at parallels between the, the uh, canine separation anxiety and human separation anxiety. Uh, canine OCD, what's called actually canine compulsive disorder, CCD, uh, is a pretty significant issue in a number of breeds of dogs. It's characterized by the same kind of repetitive and ritualistic behaviors that are seen in human patients with OCD. Uh, there are, these breeds are not the only ones in whom uh, the disorder is seen. It's a very significant issue. And there's some exciting work that's being done by uh, some really brilliant scientists. Nick Dodman, who's a DVM PhD at Tufts, has actually characterized um, a, a region on canine chromosome 7 that codes for a protein that's associated with uh, flank sucking in Dobermans. And flank sucking Doberman, that's kind of an iconic uh, compulsion in dogs, and that's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem. But so the work that Nick's doing is really advancing this comparative genomic um, survey of, uh, of, of the behavioral disturbances of animals and humans. And one of the most interesting aspects of these comparisons has to do with this sort of phenomenon of compulsion in animals and humans and what it tells us potentially about the meaning of the compulsion in the human patients. Perhaps the most iconic compulsion in human patients is hand washing. In fact, compulsions that center on grooming activities are the most uh, iconic, as I said, and sometimes most difficult to, to treat. But it is also true on the animal side that compulsions center often, most often, on grooming, paw licking, pecking, sucking. And I think this similarity must speak to some shared mechanistic connection. 
Well, there are, just to, to kind of give you a couple of other stark but really, I think, notable similarities, this is a condition called trichotillomania. It's a condition where patients begin plucking out regions of their hair. Um, eyelashes are a particular destination. Any, any hair on the body can be plucked out. This poor woman has plucked out much of the hair on her scalp. But it turns out veterinarians particularly um, treat, particularly in birds like parrots, something called feather plucking disorder. And an affected bird with feather plucking disorder will, in response to stress, boredom, and particularly isolation, begin plucking out feathers and sometimes denude their bodies in a similar way to what we see in humans with trichotillomania. One of the things that I explored in the book is how veterinarians understand self-injury in animals. And there's a lot of self-injury in animals. It's not just feather plucking. There are stallions that flank bite until they bleed, dogs that lick and lick and lick their paws until they bleed and then bite, and birds that use their talons and their beaks to peck at their own skin until they bleed. Veterinarians have a way of formulating this problem, why it happens, and what they have, they have very interesting ideas about how to prevent it, and they're actually fairly effective. And I think this represents a potential translational opportunity for psychiatrists and psychotherapists and others to learn more about the human animal patient. Finally, I devoted one chapter to the question of eating disorders in animals. When I originally asked the question, could an animal get an eating disorder, I thought it was a ridiculous question. Uh, at that point, I was thinking of eating disorders as I, I had in my head an adolescent girl in her bedroom looking in a mirror with body dysmorphic disorder, thinking that she looked fat. And if you ask, does an animal get an eating disorder like that, the answer, of course, is no. But if you ask any doctor, whether they're a veterinarian or a physician, does the environment, does stress affect the eating of your patient, of course the answer would be yes. In some cases, stress increases eating. In other cases, stress decreases eating. And in fact, I learned through my research that veterinarians are aware of all kinds of eating disorders in animals. Food hoarding is common, binge eating, nocturnal eating, secret eating. By the way, these are considered in even the new DSM-5 uh, sort of not otherwise specified forms of eating disorders. But the two most interesting were something called thin sow syndrome, which is a syndrome of um, young female pigs when they are transitioning from maternal dependence to entry into the pre-adult herd of pigs. Some respond to that stress by decreasing their eating and in some cases cessation of eating completely. They stop going into heat in a, what I believe is a parallel with uh, the case of some human anorexic nervo nervosa patients who stop having their periods. There are changes in hypothalamic function in their hair. Some of them go on to starve themselves to death. And there's also a syndrome that's seen in captive marine mammals, beluga whales, dolphins, uh, gorillas, chimps, and great apes, who respond to social stress by self-inducing vomiting. Well, to finish, I think the real question is all of this is very interesting, and I think it's brand new to physicians. Um, it's not brand new to veterinarians. But I think it's important that we physicians are aware that the disorders that we become very familiar with and very expert on are not always uniquely human. That it is important that we recognize that animals across the species divide may spontaneously develop them. And most importantly, that our colleagues, veterinarians, have tremendous resources of information and experience which we need to uh, have access to. We need to reach out and collaborate. In fact, I would say that translational medicine has been responsible for some of the most important triumphs of the last decade. But most of the translational medicine that we think about has to do with information that comes from the bench to the bedside. I would suggest that this perspective, this alternative perspective, this species-spanning perspective, represents an elastic recoil from the micro-inspection of traditional translational research to a more broad species-spanning perspective which connects the diseases of animals from birds and mammals, reptiles, fish, leads to new hypotheses, which can then lead to investigation, which can then benefit not only the human patient, but the animal patient. 
And so I'll close by reading to you from the last paragraph of my book, Zubiquity. Our essential connection to animals is ancient and runs deep. This calls for physicians to join veterinarians, wildlife biologists, and patients in moving beyond the human bedside to barnyards, jungles, seas, and skies. Because the future of our world depends not solely on how we humans fare, but rather by how all of the patients of the planet live, grow, get sick, and heal. Thank you very much.